Nothing captures the imagination of the public more than a spot of giant killing in the FA Cup, a touch of daring do by one of its unconsidered trifles. And in season 1958-9, it was the turn of Norwich City, then of the third division, to confound everybody. They beat Manchester United, and then Cardiff of the second division, and then Tottenham Hotspur. And in their quarter-final replay with Sheffield United, Norwich's main goal scorer, a bulldozer called Terry Bly, was again on the mark. Emrys Walters. The ball comes out this time to Hill, who's gone out to the left wing. He puts it back to Crow. Crow upfield uh, tries to find Hill, but Hill falls, and it's Sheffield United trying to start an attack, but they don't get very much chance because these terrier-like uh, canaries, as they're called, Norwich, don't give them a moment, and the whistle's gone for an infringement against the Norwich player for what appeared uh, to be a bit of, of a, a push there and it's going to be a free kick inside the Sheffield United half and it's Graham Shaw to take it. Now here comes Graham Shaw, takes it right-footed, puts it upfield, a dummy sold by one of the Sheffield United forwards, but in comes Thurlow and bangs it hard and high, the highest this, hour, this evening, but it goes instead to Coldwell and Coldwell returns the cover with a high one into the penalty area, but Lutt Butler is there, his header comes very nicely to Crow, who plays very good football indeed, comes out keeping at it all the time, but Graham Shaw, like a flash of lightning, cuts in, intercepts and puts a long pass out to the left flank he's being chased by Lewis who's come right across and in the end it's Lewis who concedes a throw in two or three yards from the Norwich line on this side of the field and it's McCrone coming two or three yards from his own line the right half McCrone to take the throw in for Norwich Norwich leading by a goal to nil we still have Hamilton off the field as we wait for this throw in it comes right down the line but it comes again to Graham Shaw, who makes the goal one well, then sells a dummy, puts it back to Joe Shaw. Joe Shaw in centre circle, lobs it upfield, but it's a Norwich head who gets to it, but not very far, because Hoyland covering up, gathers, puts it back into the penalty area, but again it's headed out for Norwich, and the ball comes away this time, to their inside forward, inside forward, Alcock running through, puts a nice pass on to Terry Bly, Terry Bly going through, he's going to try and get to this, and it's there! It's a goal! Norwich won by three goals to two. Their booming anthem on the ball city threatened to carry them all the way to Wembley. But the cup can also be cruel. And Norwich, having been given so much, were then pipped by a single goal by Luton in the semi-finals. And Luton, in turn, were beaten by Nottingham Forest at Wembley. Forest with a winger called Roy Dwight, a cousin of pop superstar Elton John, and a player who in the final scored a goal and broke a leg. And White seems to be concentrating very much in the centre of the field right at this moment. Now the ball for Nottingham Forest goes down to the left. Imlex onto it and he's beaten his man. Very comfortable indeed inside the area. Puts it right across the first time. Shot there by White. There it is. White. Well, there it is. Just over nine minutes of the first half gone. And Nottingham Forest have gone into the lead through White. Playing, as I said, in this roving role in the centre of the field. And slamming it past Vainham. So it's Forrest. One up. Owen again. Pushing it back. Upfield of the halfway line. But intercepted there by McKinley. Centre half. McKinley for Nottingham Forest. Pushing it across this side of the field. Comes down to Gray. Gray takes it on the turn down to Imlek. McNally moving back. Gray turns. Imlek turn, tries to turn on the inside of him. But it cannons off halfback Groves. And comes across this wing now to Bingham down in front of us. And he's challenged by the fullback, McDonald, and the ball turned into touch. Bingham takes a quick one, but Morton, rather slow to get at it, Bingham throws it down the wing, Morton once again. Shadowed there by McKinley, the centre half of Nottingham Forest. Finds the ball turned into touch again, Bingham still going to take it. Throws it inside there to Cummins, Cummings to Bingham again. Then a lob inside the Nottingham Forest penalty area, but well back is in black. Pick onto that ball, swing it out to the left over this side. Wilson racing for it. Sid Owen chasing him down on this side, but Wilson's got the advantage. Has Owen moving back. The ball goes loose inside the penalty area, and there is stopped by a left fullback, McNally. Right fullback, rather, McNally. Switches the ball upfield, but Forrest again, cheekily, take it quite comfortably. Inside left, Gray, Gray, right across the field, ahead of there, and then Gray is there. Scored by Tommy Wilson. Forrest 2, Luton 1, the final score. 
and the following year, 1960, a shaven head entered the lists. It belonged to Derek Dugan of Blackburn Rovers, tall, angular and bright, a future chairman of the Players' Union, the PFA, but then a young eccentric, who not only shaved his head, but asked for a transfer on the morning of the final between Blackburn and Wolves. And, it has to be said, Blackburn and Dugan were not at their best. Wolves leading by two goals to nothing. Here comes goalkeeper Leyland with one of his few very bad kicks. Uh, slices that ball, or rather hooks it in golfing terms. You must think of golf today too. Uh, way out to the left, into touch, just inside the Wolves' half. Once again, the Wolves try to attack down their right wing. So, again, the ball is released carefully back to goalkeeper Leyland, who throws the ball out this time. Rather short. Up into the centre circle. Wolves have it again. Dealey cutting down through the centre, being tackled by Ronnie Clayton. And Ronnie Clayton puts a good 25-yard pass. Right back to goalkeeper Leyland. Leyland, a long kick. And this time, Dugan beats his man in the air, gets hold of the ball, puts it through now to Bimson. Bimson trying to turn that in. Can he do it? No. Blocked by Jenny Harris. And a corner to Macba. I make it about three minutes left for play now. Less than three minutes. Uh, and I think this quick one is going to go. It doesn't know. McLeod has come away. Douglas lobs that ball right across the walls, go straight into Finlayson's hands. He picks it out the air very cleanly, throws it across to Dealey. Dealey, the Wolves right winger, is racing down now. Murray and Starbutt, and they're going to be offside unless they're very careful. But no, Dealey is taking the ball on down. Finally, he puts it to his outside man. And Wolves have brought the ball back across field until he comes to Broadbent, who's only about two or three yards from this wing. And playing at a walking pace, they get the ball out to Flowers. Flowers now through to Starbutt, who's onside. He crosses the ball across the goal. It's missed by Leyland there, and he's turned into the net. Turned into the net there. Two misses by Matt Woods and Leyland. And finally turned into the net by Dealey. Dealey also scored another. Blackburn contributed an own goal, and Wolves won by three goals to nil. And to cap Blackburn's unhappy day, their fullback David Whelan broke a leg, one of a run of injuries in the final, which led to talk of a Wembley hoodoo. But Wembley, the old stadium, takes the good with the bad. And against powerful Spain later that year, England were undoubtedly good. Now here come England with a long pass, away up the wing. Can Bobby Smith hold it in play? He has done. Smith on the left wing now with the other England forwards coming up to him. Greaves is there, but that's a bad pass by Smith. And uh, Spain takes the ball away through Soros, the captain, away down in the inside right position, twisting and turning like a corkscrew there on this wet pitch, finally sending it to De Stefano, who's come up into the uh, centre forward position now for once, away out now, and there's Henter going for the ball, and he reckons that he's had his legs lifted from under him, and the referee agrees, and he now reckons he's been hurt. I don't think he possibly could have been. Anyhow, it's a free kick to Spain, just outside the England penalty area. Been taken by Hento. He nips that with him. That's a very dangerous one. And a very good header by Di Stefano. And it's taken well by Springham. Springham throws it away. And away come England. Bobby Smith is well up there. Greaves is coming inside now. But instead of which, uh, Charlton puts the ball through to Haynes. Haynes is still taking the ball up now. Going through and he's bowled over just outside the Spanish penalty area. Tackled from behind. And the player is losing a lot of the classical football that we saw in these conditions. Now the ball was just pushed forward there by Greaves for Douglas to uh, run on to. But the referee whistled up. The Spaniards were not ten yards away. And that's lucky for England because uh, Douglas wasn't even looking for that one. Now Greaves going to chip it across the goal. Here it goes up. Got the heads to Charlton. It goes loose. There's a flick out there by Verges, the left half. And an acrobatic kick again. And that sends the ball well down into the England half. Uh, 
Swan doesn't quite know what to do with it. Eventually decides he'll put it up to his right back arm field. Arm field, a low ground pass, which only finds the Spaniard. And there's little Henter, the outside left with it. Through now to Del Sol. Del Sol, a lovely back heel. Uh, but as he beats one England man, he hasn't beaten Jimmy Grease. Jimmy Grease, a short square pass, and it's only a beautiful movement by Flowers. Flowers across field, out ahead, Sands going through, and away out now to Charlton on the left wing. They're just level with the Spanish penalty area. Charlton draws the ball back. He's coming up to his full back. He's holding the ball all the time. Chips it across, headed by Smith. He's there! Smith has scored! And that clearly got the Spaniards' body. A beautiful drawback by Charlton, and a model header by Smith. Bobby Smith of Tottenham, a warrior of a centre-forward, scored twice. The mercurial Jimmy Greaves got one, and so did Brian Douglas. England four, Spain two. And with players of the quality of Johnny Haynes and Bobby Charlton in the side as well, it seemed likely that one day they'd tear some poor opponent apart. That day was the 15th of April, 1961 and Scotland were chosen. Free kick to England, three yards inside the centre circle, and um, the score with about 18 minutes play gone is still England 1, Scotland naught. Uh, a good one right up there, oh, much too good. Uh, even against the wind, uh, that one by Flowers, lobbed right over all the forwards, over all the defenders, straight into half his hands. Up goes Swan in the air, and I certainly thought he pushed here St John in the back. Free kick to Scotland, very nearly halfway through in the England half, but a poor one there, and England just working that ball, and they're working it very much to carelessly in my estimation because against St John nearly flicked a very dangerous pass out to Wilson on the left wing but he couldn't do it uh, finally it was cleared away upfield by England into the centre circle now Scotland have it and it's allowed to run forward to Mackay Mackay a nice pass to Quinn Quinn holding the ball flicks it away out to Wilson and Wilson trying to get past Armfield loses the ball Armfield holds it in play inside very neatly along the ground to Robson Robson beautifully timed pass to Douglas who's come inside to inside right now upfield now to Haynes Haynes forward to Greaves he's going through but I think he's going to beat him no he's hooked it over the goalkeeper's head and into the net a magnificent piece of work by Greaves and Haynes well no wonder the Italians want to pay a quarter of a million for him they deserve it if they get that sort of football superbly timed Haynes to Greaves and Greaves rushing on, timed it perfectly and hooked it over half his head, giving him no chance as he came out, just as if he were standing still. And I make that now, I think that is 19 and a half minutes, say 20, and England are leading by two goals to nothing. Now here comes Scotland, still trying valiantly. Good head out by Flowers, gets the ball away up to Douglas. Douglas neatly inside. And then are three England forwards. Smith pushes the ball now to Haynes. Haynes, Charlton on the outside. Smith and Greaves. And Smith gets it, puts it through to Greaves. And uh, the side flick this time by Smith was a bit too hard. And uh, Greaves couldn't get a shot in. So now Scotland come back, take the ball up to the centre line. The score England eight, Scotland three. And the ball worked out now to Wilson, who's been a real box of tricks on the left wing. And he gets the ball back to just outside the penalty area, flicks it inside this time. It's intercepted by Robson. Robson puts the spring it. And uh, Ian St. John came in there with his foot and the referee saying, uh, not tackle the goalkeeper, please, with your foot. The spring it hasn't been hurt. He's leaned down his ankle. It looks all right. He's cleared into touch. Into touch, 10 yards inside the Scottish half. And the throwing goes from the left back up to the left half and can through to Ian St. John, the centre forward, making a road for Quinn, who's going out away on the right wing for Scotland, level with the England penalty area now, being marked by McNeil. McNeil stops the ball, treads on it, turns round, and all members of the England team seem deciding that they will sell the dummy and drink this way and body swerve so that uh, the Scottish team just cannot get an idea what they're going to do. But his kick this time is out of play. Halfway inside the England half. Scotland coming back, putting the ball through and out of Mackay. Mackay's never ceased urging his forwards and indeed doing their work for them if he could. The ball's only just outside the England penalty area and Ernst and John takes a tremendous kick which uh, I would have thought been penalised by both referees. There's dangerous but it was cleared anyhow by Swan and um, the referees whistled up for something 
Oh, free kick to be taken by Shura, the Scottish right back. Uh, Scotland now bring the ball back in the centre of the England half, pushing it forward there for Quinn. Quinn loses the ball in the tackle, sends it up through to Greaves, Greaves through to Charlton. Charlton trying to do too much with the ball, they're losing because it bounces off a Scottish leg. But uh, back come the England defenders with Greaves. Greaves now starting an attack through to Haynes. Haynes lobbing one forward, flicked there uh, sideways by Douglas. Douglas through to Smith, and Smith finds one there, shoots, and he scores! And that is England's ninth goal. This combination of the England forwards has to be seen to be believed. Now, Douglas Lowe told you that I have never seen an England side play like this, and I said that a long time ago. 41 minutes play gone, and England now lead by nine goals to three. Uh, they are bewildering. They are just like Quicksilver, and nobody knows where the shot's coming from next. England nine, Scotland three. Poor Frank Hathi in the Scotland goal. The England scorers that famous day, Greaves with three, Haynes and Smith with two each, Douglas and Bobby Robson, who some 20 years later, of course, would be England's manager himself. A 9-3 is still the record win and biggest aggregate for the long-running feud between England and Scotland. And if that was one of England's finest moments, there's no doubt either that the outstanding club side of the time was Tottenham Hotspur, a side built with care and precision by Bill Nicholson, a side of light and shade, steel and rhythm, led by Danny Blanchflower and given infinite variety by players such as Dave Mackay, John White, Cliff Jones and Bobby Smith. They won the league championship with firm and persuasive authority and then met Leicester City in the FA Cup final. Would they be the first club in the 20th century to complete the league in cup double? Cheeseborough for Leicester, trying to move it down the right wing, stopped there by Henry. Over the Smith, up in the middle is Allen, but it goes to Jones. Jones across this side of Dyson, who's in the outside right position at this moment. Allen, inside forward, moving onto the ball. I don't think he can part with it. Yes, he does along the ground of Dyson again, left foot inside. Smith shoots and it's there! Bobby Smith has scored for Spurs! 30 minutes play gone in the second half. Spurs leading by one goal to nil. Scored uh, by Bobby Smith, uh, centre forward after 23 and a half minutes. Ball into touch on the far side. Thrown down by McClinton. Comes to loose to Mackay. Mackay. Moving down the Spurs wing over the far side. Dyson's there, and as the ball goes into touch again in line with the Leicester penalty area, it's back to you, Ray McLendenny. Thank you, Alan, and the referee, as I take over, blows because um, I think Leicester tried to pinch a couple of yards of ground on the throw in. It's below their penalty area, 16 yards in their far corner flag. Nodded very quickly up now to. Keyworth, Keyworth tries to send his own fellas going. They bring the ball right across field here, across to Norman, Richie Norman. And Spurs intercept that. The ball is put up to Bobby Smith. Bobby Smith inside now to White. White back through to Smith. Smith taking it right down the line, across the goal. Ahead of there. It's in the net. It's in the net. That's a beautiful goal by Dyson. They upset Smith, but that's a beautiful goal. Smith lobbed that right across the whole defence, across to the left wing. And there Bobby Smith, who made the first goal and pushed it in the back of the net, lobbed a beautiful centre over and Dyson went into it. Eight feet up, son of Ginger Dyson, the jockey. And he slashed it with his head into the net and now Spurs are two up. And 2 nil it was. The first time the double had been completed since Aston Villa managed it way back in 1897. Well, that year, 1961, was important for another reason, of course. It was the year which saw the end of the maximum wage. £20 a week was the most a player could earn before then. And Fulham, free of red tape, immediately made Johnny Haynes the first £100 a week footballer. The great Tom Finney had retired from the game just a year before. 
tough luck, you might think. And yet, years later, he looked back at his playing days with nothing but affection. I don't think in our day that uh, anybody could say they made a lot of money out of the game, you know, but I thought at the time that we were well paid. I don't think you really bothered about uh, the fact that you were you were getting 10 or 12 quid a week and the average fella that, that was working in the building trade was on three pounds a week. I suppose by, you know, comparison standards, you were a hell of a sight better off than he was. Um, I don't think anybody really made big money out of football in those days because it was a maximum wage, you know, it was £12 when I came out of the forces in '46, and I finished in 1960 and it was £20. Um, so I, I, nobody could have made a fortune on, the, on those sort of wages. And, and the reason I, I think that, uh, you know, players didn't move about um, or want to move about in those days was because, of course, it was a maximum wage. So if you played with Arsenal, you played with Manchester, or you played with Preston, you were in the first division, invariably you, you were on top money and you, you got the same sort of wages. The nearest I got to leaving Preston was, of course, when I had an offer from an Italian club, uh, Palermo, and um, we, we had played in 53 in, in Italy, and uh, I was approached after by this uh, Italian, uh, and he said, I will offer you £10,000 to to sign on for a two-year contract, you see, and, then, and in those days we were earning £14 a week, you know, and, and, and he just wouldn't believe me when I said, like, you know, the, the wages I was on, he said, you are kidding, you are joking, and, um, and of course I came back full of this and then said and put it to the club and I went to see the chairman and uh, he was called Nathaniel Buck, he's dead and buried now, and uh, he said, well, anyway, what's £10,000? What's ten thousand pounds to you? And I said, well, ten thousand pounds to me is a fortune. And I said, I've got to think that I'm going to be playing another ten years here to earn that sort of money. But it was quite obvious to me that there was little point in trying to pursue it any further because in those days that was as far as it went. And so now it was Tottenham's turn to have a tilt at the European Cup, and they started well. Gornik of Poland fell. So did Feyenoord of Holland and Dukla of Prague, which carried the North London club to the semi-finals. And to date with Benfica of Portugal, the Eagles of Lisbon. The Spurs lost the first leg in Portugal by 3-1, but the return at White Hart Lane was European football at its very best. Well, the Spurs are still two goals in the rear on the aggregate for two. Joe Brown takes the kick, puts it upfield. Smith and uh, I noticed that he was barged there by left half Cruz would come across, leaving Hermano to guard the centre. Although both them missed it, Hermano was there. Now the ball was whipped out to Greaves. Greaves on the left wing. Loses it as it's turned into touch. Spurs ball now level with Benfica. Penalty area over on the far side of the field. A long throw by Mackay. A header in there to White. White's pulled down in the centre of the field. It's a penalty! It's a penalty! Pulled down from behind. White pulled down from behind. No, I don't think it is. It's a free kick against White. No, I think it is a penalty. It's very hard to tell. Uh, the referee is pointing away from us, but I think he's moving the Portuguese players out of the penalty area. Yes, it is a penalty for White being pulled down. And he certainly was pulled down. Referee putting the ball on the spot. Blanche uh, placing it. Now, who will take the penalty? It is a penalty against Ben Pika. Blanche Flaw, I think, looks as though he's the man who's going to take it. Standing in his goal is Costa Pereira. All the others are outside the area. Blanche Flaw has decided a skipper to come up. He's going to take it. He hits it. It's there! It's there! And that was the way of it, with Benfica going on to win the European Cup for the second year running. But Spurs Day would come. As for England, well, they too were now to meet a nation that spoke Portuguese, the great Brazilians. England were the only one of the four home countries to qualify for the 1962 World Cup finals in Chile. And, without looking too impressive in their group games, they reached the last eight, 
with Brazil their next formidable hurdle. A good tackle there by Wilson, but Garincha's back with it, slides it forward along the ground, and Norman has to watch for Amarildo, who comes in just like an eel. And Norman this time uh, misses his pass out. Garincha very nearly got away, but a good tackle back by Norman has put the ball in for a Brazilian throw in, halfway inside, the England half on the far side of the field. England now trailing as they did earlier in the game, 1-2 to the cup holders. A very good header there indeed by Norman, who's been very cool and an absolute rock uh, in England's defence all through this series. Turns the ball away out to Armfield, the right back. He lobs it up towards Hitchens and Douglas, but between them, and so back come Brazil. Brazil in their yellow shirts with their green collars and cuffs. Nice ball through to Amarildo, Amarildo to Corinth, shows in the centre of the field. He shoots! It's a goal! A beautiful one! Head spring it absolutely going all ways. I tell you, this Gorincha, he is the nearest thing to Stanley Matthews, and he can shoot as well. Now listen to the guns going off. <laughs> Fifteen minutes play gone then in the second half, and the World Cup holders are now leading England by three goals to one. Half-time was 1-1, Garincha and Hitchens, and in the second half, a splendid opportunist effort by Amarildo from a hard free kick, and then a lovely jinking dribble and a lob into the top left-hand corner of the net by Garincha. Three then for Brazil, and only one to England. But England are playing, and it's no disgrace to be beaten by a team like Brazil, who once again move into England half. Oh, there's Garincha, the eel, with it. <laughs> Turning in past two men, past three men. It takes four England white shirts to bowl him over. Brazil won by three goals to one, and, fulfilling the expectations of most people on earth, they duly retained the World Cup. Jimmy Armfield of England, who was voted one of the best fullbacks in the tournament, watched those great Brazilians, including their wizard of a winger, Garincha, from close range. Brazil didn't have Pele, but they did have Garincha, and Vava, and Didi, and Zagallo. They had some very good players, the two Santoses at fullback. I think they were possibly, man for man, one of the most skillful outfits that they've put out. But uh, Garincha proved to be the match winner. He was not only a very talented player with the ball, he was a goal scorer as well. And as he came along from 1958, where he first came in in Sweden, he was away, he was a sensation as a right winger. As he came along in the next few years, he became very skillful at hitting free kicks and getting his head onto far post crosses and getting shots in out of nothing. He was peculiar, really. He seemed to have a limp. Uh, people said he had one leg shorter than the other and he'd come out of the back streets of Rio. And, of course, when he died, he... He died in a rather sorrowful way as well. But he was slightly hunched in the shoulders, very quick over about five yards. I would compare him with Matthews over five yards, who I always thought was one of the quickest players I've ever seen. And Garincha, though, could stand somebody still, and then he'd be off, and he never gave the defender a chance for a second bite at it. Once he went, that was it. Spurs, meanwhile, having retained the FA Cup in 1962, had the European Cup Winners' Cup in their sights. And this time, by way of Glasgow Rangers, Slovan Bratislava and OFK Belgrade, they went all the way to the final in Rotterdam. Their opponents were Atletico Madrid, and Spurs had fun. Spurs still lead by three goals to one. Greaves, White and Dyson. One from the penalty spot for Madrid. And now Spurs, Dyson. Dyson trying to turn it inside. It doesn't reach Smith. It's intercepted. The ball is cleared back to the keeper and he throws upfield to try and get Madrid moving. That's a wild clearance there from Norman, but helped on its way by the left fullback Henry for Spurs. One or two of the Spurs players seem to be just limping a little bit at this stage. Little Dyson had trouble with an ankle. White is limping and Ron Henry, I think, is limping. Just a bit. Now a through ball for Jones, but he doesn't beat it. Well, he, he tried to beat it, but two of the Madrid defenders came back, rather smartish, intercepted, and the ball is cleared upfield. But now the Spurs seem to be much more in possession. They're using the ball with much more thought than they did in the first period of this half. And, of course, with three goals at the backing, they might well. Jones 
on the inside now. White on the outside of him. Down goes Jones again. Yes, and I think he will get a free kick, although it didn't look that particularly vicious that time. But the Spurs get a free kick just outside the penalty area. Referee Van Duren from Holland sending the Atletico Madrid players back 10 yards. Blanchflower and Greaves hovering over the ball at the moment. Blanchflower tapping it sideways. Miss Smith, who puts it a first time shot, but right into the ruck of Madrid defenders, and the ball's dead. Little Tyson gets it across, and Greaves turns it there, and a wonderful for Spurs from Greaves. But Greaves, too, White, and Dyson have put the Spurs very much on top. They were well on top in the first half, faded away a little at the start of the second, but have now come right back in possession, and they're keeping possession of this ball and giving the forwards of Madrid absolutely no chance at all in which to move it. And now the attack of Madrid's trying to get going, but their racing back is Marquis again, just takes the ball neatly from one of the forwards, waits for the return pass, clears the ball upfield, and the Spurs come away again. Down to the right is Bobby Smith, signalling for him to go straight through. It's Dyson who's going to shoot, and it's there. Oh, a great goal by little Dyson. Bobby Smith indicated to him, go on your own, and Dyson did. And with a left foot shot, that made it number five. And 5-1 it was, perhaps Tottenham's finest hour and a half. The first British club to win a major European trophy. Commentators, Alan Clark of course, and Brian Moore. Manchester United, for their part, were still rebuilding after Munich. They brought the brilliant Dennis Law back from Torino in Italy for £115,000, a British record. And an imp of an Irishman called George Best was beginning to hit the headlines, not always for what he did on the pitch. Their side was taking shape, and in 1963, they were back at Wembley. So that's a, a goal kick to Leicester, and for a moment, the roars around this now covered Wembley Stadium cease, uh, and spectators take a breather as do the players, while Banks takes a short goal kick, gets the ball back to hand, kicks from hand, right up towards the right wing here. Now the Cantor, French United skipper is there, up through to Charlton, Charlton stabbing it, Back to Setters, Setters back to Cantrell. Cantrell coming up and attacking out the left wing. Charlton cutting in. His full back still outside, but um, Cantrell uh, and Charlton decide to put it up there until Charlton races in on a loose ball there that really had the Leicester defenders in order and a brilliant save by Banks. And now here comes Pat Curran putting it now through to Dennis Law. And he scored! And Law has scored! Well, one moment of slackness. And Manchester United are leading by one goal to nothing. Throw in now to Leicester, level with an opponent's penalty area. Throw in taken by Keyworth, Springfield are going in there. Oh, it's a tremendous high kick. It's almost up on this newly erected roof here at the stand. Clearance by folks right up in the air. Another throw in by Leicester in the same place. Comes through to the left back, Norman. Norman right cross field. Keyworth, Keyworth trying to bring it away out to Riley. Riley's got it. Riley now going past two men no, and Charlton comes back and tackles him. Charlton defensive away turns the ball into touch on the other side of the field in roughly the same position. And now away goes McClintock, a very clever throw in. McClintock turned inside now. Can Gibson do it? McClintock right across the goal. And oh, this time Gastel gets it very neatly indeed. Picks it very cleanly out of the air. Saving the day for United. Score still less than all. Manchester one. And away upfield to Giles. Giles out there to Charlton. Charlton's completely unmarked. Cutting into the edge of the penalty area. Blast one. And it's there. It's there. Or third. The goalkeeper got his hands to it, but he couldn't stop it. Well, that's the paid the penalty. They left that wide open, a long cross to Charlton. He coasted on the penalty area. Drove in a pile driver which Banks could only divert, and Hurd was right up to slam it straight into the net. So that's Hurd now in the 12th minute of the second half. Leicester City North, Manchester United 2. Goal kick then to Manchester United, and as you can tell from the crowd here, uh, they seem to think that it's pretty well settled, and certainly the pace of the game has dropped and the tension has gone. But uh, Manchester holding on the ball. And there Gaskell is penalised 
for not bouncing the ball in four steps. That's an indirect free kick about two or three yards inside the penalty area. He was trying to be too clever. So both keepers have uh, been guilty uh, of elementary fouls. Referee is now pacing out his ten yards and he's whistling back uh, the United Red Bank of defenders until they are ten yards off. Law doesn't feel he wants to go there, but Colin Applin is telling them now, do get back and do what the referee tells you. And still, uh, we're just waiting. Law is uh, spoken to by the referee, and we're just waiting. Now, it's a very quick tap, and he... What's happened? Once again, Manchester United were not ten yards off the ball. The kick will be retaken. It'll be a very quick one taken by Gibson to the right half McClintock back to McClintock back to Gibson back to Keyworth this time left back Norman tries to get a bang but that red wall of Manchester stands firm scores still Manchester United to Leicester City naught and now Leicester moving forward with a nice one there through to Gibson Gibson back through to Appleton and once again there is an appeal for a penalty and a good header and it's there it's a goal a goal by Keyworth as it ricocheted off a red Manchester United wall he flung himself level on the ground and has made it 2-1. But with David Hurd scoring a second, United won by 3-1 and the Reds were on the march again. And in a, a period of change and hardening ambition, few lines in the record book were safe. And in that same year, 1964, Howard Kendall became the youngest ever cup finalist when he played for second division Preston North End against West Ham United, still 20 days short of his 18th birthday. Kendall pushes it back to Ross, up into the West Ham penalty area. Ashworth first time shot past the post, took it on the turn there, and West Ham defenders there were certainly slow, and they gave Ashworth a wonderful chance. Had to take it smartly on the turn, which he did, and the ball went crashing past the post. For the goal kick to West Ham, which Stander will take for them. Well, we're after time, after the 45 minutes on our watch, so this is injury time we're playing at the moment. As West Ham move into the attack, two goals each at the moment, Hurst onto the ball. He won't get a shot in, but he does park with the ball to the right wing to Braybrook. Braybrook right across the head of there, and it's there! It's the goal to West Ham! has made it 3-2 for West Ham and on the right fullback down in front of us went down on his hands and knees and dumped at the turf in sheer enjoyment or whatever you like to say about it and he's looking at the trainer's bench now and they're telling him that there can only be a minute or so to go there it is West Ham then three voice the scorer in injury time here at Wembley West Ham, United 3, Preston North End 2. That's Preston now with Smith trying along one up through the middle. And Ashworth racing through and it's brought down. It's a penalty, I think. It's a penalty as Ashworth is brought down. No, it's not. It's a free kick right on the edge of the area. A dramatic finish and heartbreak for young Kendall. But for West Ham's stylish left winger John Sissons, the joy of a winner's medal and at the age of 18, the distinction of becoming the youngest scorer in an FA Cup final. Though since then, of course, both Kendall and Sissons have lost their records. Norman Whiteside of Manchester United became the youngest scorer in an FA Cup final in 1983, 18 years, 19 days, and Paul Allen of West Ham became the youngest finalist in 1980, age just 17 years and 256 days. Allen, a member of a renowned football family, though not quite in the same bracket as the Charlton brothers, Jack and Bobby, who when they played against Scotland at Wembley in 1965, became the first brothers to appear together for England in a full international this century. And they celebrated appropriately. Throw into England, which Greaves is going to take. Byrne going out there, waiting for the throw, gets it. Turns back a yard or so, loses the ball. So it's possession to Creran now. Creran trying to flick it through. Stopped there by Jackie Charlton. The centre half to Bobby. And now Bobby's got a chance to shoot. He does. And it's there. It's a great goal by Bobby Charlton. 25 minutes gone of the first half. And England are one up. Bobby Charlton. 
after a very fine defensive move from his brother Jackie Charlton, the centre half, gave Bobby Charlton the chance to shoot from outside the penalty, which he did. Bill Brown dived, tried to punch, failed to get to the ball, and if he even touched it, it was well on its way to the corner of the net. So there it is, England lead by one goal to nil. Goal scored by outside left Bobby Charlton after 25 minutes. Ball coming to Collins, Baker goes again to Craig. Craig covering up very well, gives the ball to Law Law, coming over the halfway line, holding it, getting it out to Collins, who's now in the inside left position. Collins turning around, slowing the pace down, gives it back to Law, not a good pass. Comes back to St. John, St. John puts it over. There's Wilson coming in, a nice dummy, he leaves Cohen going the wrong way, it comes across. Law trying to get it in, Styles heads it out, and Banks gathers the ball on the six yards line and throws it out to Charlton, his outside left. Well, that was a little bit better by Scotland, but Charlton's taking the ball through, he beats Collins, comes through the halfway line, puts it through, gives it to Cleese, he's coming in, he's going to score! And he does, and Cleese has scored! Cleese hit the right-hand post after 35 minutes, a beautiful run through the middle. Brown came out, the ball hit Brown's right-hand post, paused for just a minute, and then shot into the back of the net to make it England 2, Scotland 0. And since the opening 15 minutes, England are a much better team than Scotland. Yet the final score was England 2, Scotland 2. Scotland's goals from Dennis Law and Ian St. John. <laughs>